decided to attend this session. I'm really grateful to all of them. So Rafael Riemann, Salvatore Di Dio, Lorenzo Meschini, and Benedict San Just. Uh, today we'll discuss for more or less one hour about uh, data and how mobility data in particular can uh, improve, uh, upgrade, uh, update uh, policy uh, making processes. And uh, there will be four very different, but in my opinion, uh, very interesting and also uh, in some out connecting approaches. So every speaker will, will, will talk for 10 minutes, will present his or her case study for 10 minutes. And then at the end, if there's time, if there are questions from the audience, there will be also the opportunity for a um, short Q&A session, about 10 minutes, uh, we, we talk to the audience. So I don't want to waste other time since we are all already a bit uh, late. So we'll start with the first speaker, so Rafael Riemann from Move Lab. Um, the past year, I came across one of uh, uh, the lab project, the Open Data Cam, and I loved it because uh, I thought that it was really, really an interesting open source project. Since we're talking about uh, mobility data, uh, of course, the first step is collecting data. Uh, collecting data is, of course, crucial in order to use such, such data for, for improving policies. And I think that the perspective uh, pursued by the Open Data Camp project is very interesting. So yeah, I invited Rafael and I thank him. Uh, I can see there is a really nice uh, a Christmas tree uh, <laughs> behind him. So I want to know more about your project, uh, this open source tool to quantify the reality. This is the bottom line of the uh, Open Data Camp project. And I want to know a, a bit more, learn a bit more about the context results you achieved and also the benefit that uh, public administration, but also companies or other kind of stakeholders can uh, um, have by using your, your tool. The floor is yours, Rafael. Thank you, Dominica, for the introduction. I'm really happy for the invitation. And um, yeah, thanks for giving me the chance to uh, to talk about our Open Data Camp. So um, my name is Rafael. Um, I'm a geographer by trade and an urbanist. Um, and uh, yeah, like, as, like you've already mentioned, Open Data Camp, um, we call it an open source tool to quantify the world. Um, and um, I would like to start off with uh, showing you a little bit about where this idea actually came from. And I will share my screen for that. Um, one second. Um, OK, is the presentation showing? Yes, OK. So um, about three or four years ago, um, a mix of circumstances led us to the idea of creating Open Data Cam. Um, the first one was our lovely view from the terrace of our office. Um, of course, we are a mobility company, and we were looking down on one of the biggest intersections of the, of the city, or leading out of the city, so to say, of Stuttgart at this time. And um, we thought we have to do something with this intersection and this view on this place. And um, a couple of different things came into place. Um, there's also exploring new technolo uh, te technology. Um, in this case, it was YOLO 9000. This is uh, an open source um, object detection algorithm that is um, quite easy to use. It's even as easy that even I could use it <laughs> as not being a software engineer or anything close to that. Um, and um, we got to uh, got it to work from um, yeah from our balcony. As you can see, we detected a lot of cars and going in and out of the city. And um, yeah, like I said, it was it was really easy and very performant. Um, and um, another thing that came kind of into this world uh, into this uh, into this area of ideas was. Um, the GPU Jetson boards, which launched um, by the time um, or kind of got popular by the time. And um, I always like to call them a, a Raspberry Pi on steroids. Um, it runs with a GPU, so a graphic processing unit, which is a perfect fit for our idea of um, value evaluating data streams. And um, these three things kind of came together with um, with our thoughts of 
changing mobility um, for good and really um, challenged ourselves with, uh, with this quote that we put out there, how might we create the candy crush of mobility? This was the first idea that came to our minds. Of course, it was mind blowing. <laughs> um, so the idea of Beat the Traffic, the game was launched. Beat the Traffic um, is a game that let you enchant your city and your mobility um, by, I'll show you a short video, by clicking on the cars and letting them disappear. Um, and we thought, Okay, we've solved the problem of mobility. We uh, cleaned out the car, uh, the, the cars out of our city, and um, also made it a really great, fun <laughs> way to do it. And uh, we had all these unicorns and trees and rainbows, nicer things than cars running through our cities. And um, at some point, um, as I saw my high score getting higher and higher, I thought. I think I know this interaction from somewhere. And I think I was, uh, I thought I was kind of uh, familiar with this. And um, so I thought back to, I went back to, um, to, my, to my geography studies, as you know, uh, I studied geography and, and um, a couple of times during my studies, um, this email came into my inbox. Um, I'm sorry, this is German, but I'll translate it real quick for you. So this is a call for, uh, a call for an off job offer. Um, for sitting at an inter intersection in the, uh, in the street and counting from April to the, uh, September, um, counting um, six to eight days in the week, uh, cars that go by this intersection for eight euro 90 an hour. Um, for uh, my student loan, I thought this was maybe a good idea to do that. But um, of course, um, this is kind of where this idea of open data cam sparked to my mind is um, we had this um, algorithm and its place where uh, we have a high score, which is essentially counting cars. And um, so this um, is the kind of the birth hour of uh, Open Data Cam. And um, the most current video that we made um, about Open Data Cam is this. So I believe you have no sound, but I'll just let you read the text. <laughs> Okay. So, um, summing this up, we basically tuned the software that we created for um, for our game to actually do something that might make a dent in how we understand mobility and how we understand. Um, um, yes, mobility in our cities and basically being able to count moving things, um, no matter if it's a car or if it's uh, whatever else would move through your city. Um, and this um, open source um, setup, like I said, um, basically consists of this um, open uh, of this uh, Jackson board hooked up to a energy supply and a video and a, da and a um, webcam. And this webcam, you can set up this um, this little box. You can set it up on your intersection, and it will detect um, the things that move across this intersection. And um, there is a small interaction um, screen with uh, paired to it, where you can draw the lines into um, into the video stream to mark the areas that you want to be counted. And um, for me, the most striking things, uh, the, the best, the, the, the great things about this tool is that um, no data ever leaves this board. Since it's the board, uh, this GPU board, um, the data is, uh, the, the, the hardware is strong enough to not have any server interactions on something uh, or nothing. Um, so the video data is, uh, is never saved. And uh, this is um, for me a clear win on um, data privacy and the data privacy. Uh, 
in um, that we have in Germany and the EU, EU, of course, is quite strong. And we believe that this is actually compliant with um, with um, the data protection laws that we have. So. Um, as we mentioned, it's um, on GitHub, and you are very welcome to contribute to Fork and um, share your experiences there. Um, Thibault, uh, which is, uh, yeah, you will meet the people who are um, who are kind of active on on there if you are interested, and be sure to persist to participate in that. So, um, Dominique, you always are also asked for how this is actually what experiences we have made so far. Um, so we have launched a. Um, yeah, again, this is a German, but it's from the Ministry of um, Traffic a funded project with the HTW, it's the University of Applied Science in Berlin and the City Lab in Berlin, who are um, testing how robust our system is and um, seeing where, uh, how use cases can be found with it. And they are, I think, actually finishing up their report now and trying to get another round of funding to continue with this. They also had a summer school with a data-driven urban innovation hackathon um and uh, some interesting um so they kind of disassembled the idea of open data cam and created a automatic um right turn signal for bikers so if the camera detects a biker on a right turn it will flash a light so cars are warned so this is not only for counting but this can also be used for different purposes and this is why we love it to be a open source tool um, but now maybe to zoom out of the picture a little bit, um, I would uh, like to talk just one or two thoughts about how this can actually benefit our community and, um, and the cities and yeah, basically as, as a digital community as we are evolving. Um, um, as you might know, there are lots of things of smart city applications that are happening um, throughout the world. This is a Link NYC station, which is a Wi-Fi station um, spread throughout New York City, um, which is conveniently um, run by um, Sidewalk Lab, which is a part of the alphabet and hence um, part of our favorite uh, search engine of the internet. Um, if you want to trust the numbers. And um, we have kind of learned how to design digital solutions with data. And um, I think now it's uh, it's our chance to learn and to, to transfer this knowledge of how to design digital spaces with data, maybe into um, understanding the interactions with physical space a little bit better. There is um, an architect um, and city planner called Jan Gehl, um, you might be familiar with his work. He basically is responsible for Copenhagen being what it is now, um, a bike-friendly city, a walkable city. And um, this started, of course, in the 70s, a long time ago. But um, I see a lot of parallels with the methodologies that he used. He counted the interactions with how people were would use public spaces and um, uh, basically uh, what we now say designing with data in the digital world he um, applied to the physical world um, already years ago, but I think Open Data Camp, for example, could um, could show the interactions that you would see um, with the physical world in a much easier way than standing there and counting and tracing pe how people use this. This is a picture of one of his um, one of his books um, where he studied how people actually interact with the squares in the city by how they would cross um, through the open space and. Um, yeah, this is, um, I think, a way that um, we could contribute with uh, understanding interactions with urban space better and hence um, creating um, yeah, cities that suit our needs a little bit more and um, doing this in a way that privacy is still, um, is still, um, is still granted and um, yeah, this is I think one of the more important things and not giving this uh, vacuum of smart cities out of our hands and letting um, big corporates handle this um, and yeah, let data flow off into who knows where. And um, yeah, I would like to end um, this with um, a quite a happy note. Uh, so um, the Move Lab has unfortunately been discontinued, so we um, we kind of have to see where our projects are going. And um, with the happy note where this is actually ending, that the Open Data Camp project we managed to find a way to still keep it alive. And the next step for the Open Data Camp project will be 
um, getting Open Data Cam um, away from the hardware that we are tied to at the moment and having it run on mobile. So um, we are currently working this uh, with a big fund by the My Galileo solution. This is the the, Germ the sorry the European answer to um, to um, to GPS. And um, they have a big fund that they just recently announced, and we were happy to gain a spot in their funding program, which will allow us to now get away from the hardware, put it on a mobile phone, and um, have um, Open Data Cam even easier to uh, to run. And um, yeah, this is what I wanted to leave you with. I'm happy to go uh, to to answer any questions, and also looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. It was very interesting to see how you move from uh, a test, an experiment to a game and then to an application and then now you're going to mobile and uh, uh, collaborating with the Galileo project. It's really, really interesting. Uh, thanks a lot. As I said before, at the end, there will be uh, probably the opportunity for, for the audience to ask uh, some questions uh, if we respect the schedule. So thanks again, and I will move to the second speaker. Uh, with Open Data Game, we have uh, a very nice and original example of how data can be gathered within the city. There are many other examples. Um, in particular, there is a project uh, I used to be involved on, which is MOVE, uh, PUSH, the design lab that I founded in which I'm currently working. Uh, it's a research lab, so we work on a research project, and in particular one, uh, MOVE, was uh, an Horizon 2020 project that we conducted the uh, past three years that, that ended uh, a couple of months ago and now a spin-off started, a spin-off called the Move B Corp. And Move has a very uh, nice approach in my opinion because we try to transform sustainable mobility into a sport in order to try to drive a change into citizens. But there is more because uh, the project aims at uh, use mobility data we collect to our game in order to shape new mobility policies. And uh, Toti, which is my colleague at PUSH and has also moved uh, the Corp CEO, will introduce now our project to talk about uh, our process to change cities' mobility by starting uh, just by playing. Thank you, Domenico. Um... I was thinking you were like pretending we don't know each other. It was it would be super fun eventually. We, we can still do it, I think. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, uh, I have a presentation. So uh, let me share my screen and I will show you something about mainly the research and something about uh, I mean how we are uh, going to um, uh, push forward this project. Um, it's, it's a similar approach that uh, also Ra Rafael told us before. Um, okay. Here it is. Um, so trying to turn mobility into something fun. That was the very first uh, discussion Domenico and I had uh, several years ago. Uh, but the reason was mainly <laughs> because of traffic. That, that was our problem. I mean, we're from Sicily, from Palermo, and one of the worst city in Europe for traffic issues. And so, uh, and we are engineers. I mean, we are like creative people, but with an engineer background. Uh, and so we try to analyze the problem. And so for changing um, traffic, and so how people move, we have to understand uh, the demand of mobility and then the offer. And so there are solutions that are uh, driven by the demand or driven by the offer. And so what we thought is that we should work on these two fields. They are very different, of course. Uh, and so fostering more sustainable and active mobility behaviors, so less traffic, people walking, biking, using public transport, and trying to redesign policies because most of the uh, last reason uh, mobility policies in, uh, in cities, in European cities have been uh, shaped around the cars and not around people moving around. And so, yeah, this was the, the big picture, the vision we had. 
and uh, yeah, I mean, that's what Move uh, does, uh, did actually, and uh, we, we, we hope it will uh, do it again, uh, multiple times in multiple places. So fostering uh, good behaviors and uh, use data uh, to improve uh, policies in very two words. So a game and data, that's the, the two pillars of, of MOVE. Uh, we got lucky enough to be funded uh, three years ago. And so we had the opportunity to run this uh, very seriously uh, with a lot of partners all, all around Europe and also around the world. So basically the game uh, and the idea of a game gave us the opportunity to uh, uh, risk, re, um, reshape a deal, a social deal among people, among these different groups. There are um, uh, local businesses, uh, uh, universities, so the research, uh, activists, and governments. And so with these new roles uh, that we have designed inside the game, we had the opportunity to put them to, all together. To do this, of course, we had to wear different hats as we are doing today with Domenico Mo uh, that is, uh, moderating the debate and I'm presenting MOVE. So we act as community leaders to uh, understand what were the uh, main pressing challenges in different locations in Europe for uh, mobility issues. We design services, not just the app, of course, not just the game, but multiple, let's say, touch point that uh, um, uh, um, uh, initiate new new uh, activities and services. We've been service providers with the app and with the monitoring stations that you will see later on. And then with data, we act as facilitators. So we uh, gave and in a comprehensible way uh, the data gathered and we uh, collaborate with uh, citizens and stakeholders to uh, uh, think new solutions to redesign some of the measures that have been implemented in cities. And then as activists, pushing <laughs> literally governments and uh, authorities to act uh, according to what we have found together with citizens. And of course, we try to do our job as researchers. And so analyzing the data and trying to understand if there was something more. Anyway. Uh, this is, these are the results we gather very shortly. Uh, I know I don't have so much time today to present MOVE as I uh, would, uh, but um, with the app we recorded during the games that we have played, the entertainment part that we have um, offered to citizens all around Europe, uh, on average the 17% and during the tournaments we had peak by 32 or 40 percent of CO2 reduction. So basically, we map the uh, uh, habits before the use of the app and then do, during, and this was the results. And it's very impressive since we didn't change anything, just the meaning of moving around the city. Uh, we recorded a lot of uh, kilometers uh, run by sustainable mobility means, and we triggered a lot of ideas. And some of them have been already implemented or are going, I mean, are uh, in a way feeding, nurture the debate in, the, in these cities uh, for future policies. So I will go through the Movigator. There is our tool to uh, funnel uh, a lot of activities with a sense. That was the uh, goal of the Movigator. Uh, you can find on, on the internet. I, I, I will try to be very brief. Domenico, please interrupt me if I'm too long. Um, so uh, here, I don't know what, what uh, yeah. Uh, on the internet, you will find this and it explains how to raise up a movement uh, about uh, um, uh, collaboration for uh, mobility purposes, but not just mobility purposes, for sustainability purposes. And of course, one of the reference was Open Data Cam. We tried to, to use it, but we didn't, but it's, it's something we would love to do in, in our uh, near future. Uh, okay, so uh, the community. So people move, that's the point. We have to talk with people and we have to understand 
uh, what are the issues they're facing. This was our uh, first point, and of course, it's the most strategic one uh, for um, applying something new, you know, trying to solve or trying to find an opportunity to, to do something new. And we had a lot of uh, playgrounds. Uh, the six cities that have applied with, with us for this uh, European project, but then other 10, another six, and then 19 universities. But unfortunately, then COVID-19 uh, shocked us. And so we uh, didn't go forward or uh, further uh, with them. Um, Co-design. And this is uh, uh, about the tools that we used to gather data, to gather information, then to use it. And so we, we tried to our best to do something nice and something that was uh, appreciated by, <laughs> by our stakeholders. And we designed together with the community that we encountered. And so uh, all the uh, touch points, digital ones and physical ones, have been uh, built together uh, and th this was very helpful to better understand which kind of data are meaningful and how then use it. Um, this is the app. I will be very, very short. Uh, so you use it uh, as you're using uh, Nike Running Plus or other uh, kind of uh, fitness app, but you are just moving around the city with sustainable mobility means. So you get, you, gather points, uh, of course, the greener, the better, and then you win something. This is gamification, as they call it. We try to push it a little bit harder. And so you can play together with your, uh, let's say, uh, friends in your city. Uh, you can play together with your uh, friends in, um, uh, in your company, for example, and you can uh, uh, play with a sponsor There is basically uh, giving you something uh, if you perform well. And then uh, you level up, so as a game, and this is very similar to what Rafael said before, uh, trying to make these things fun, of course. And then, you, of course, you can answer surveys and you can uh, give also further information that are ma mainly uh, addressed for mobility purposes or other kind of purposes. This is the experience we, we've designed together with uh, this, through this very large user research we've done in Europe. And, um, and this is basically the, the mobile app that you all, all, um, can uh, already find on, on uh, the stores and you can use it. To, we are in a sort of beta mode because we are rebuilding something, but uh, if you have feedback, it's very precious to us. And we design a, a, also an algorithm to better understand how the, um, uh, to um, certificate the CO2 reduction. And we got the certification by um, RENA and so the uh, official um, entity in Europe for providing this. Um, and so we can emit carbon credits. This is something very, very useful for the purpose of the, of the project. And we came up also with something that was meant to provide other useful information uh, for the citizens, not just enabling an environment where they can change their behavior uh, as the app, but something that we can use, that they can use uh, for collecting data and understand what's, uh, what, what is happening outside. Uh, I don't know if I'm late, but I, I, it, it's mainly over. These are some pictures of the experiences that we have done. The tons of people that we have met through all these touch points and stuff and data. This is Barcelona. Uh, these are the tools that we have designed to better analyze them uh, for let's say research purposes. Uh, this was basically what we uh, came up with, uh, like the haha. Uh, so every time we had something new or something more fun to offer to our users, uh, of course, they've been more engaged and they saved more CO2 because they used the, uh, they, they, they changed their behavior uh, easily. Uh, this is another kind of graph, but basically it says the same thing. 
so the, 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 the percentage of uh, the improvement uh, and also the number of users that have been involved. Uh, this is my last part of the presentation. Uh, so, uh, it, and it's really linked to data, not just the service. Uh, we, we don't care about the service, we care about using the data for a uh, um, useful purpose for uh, the common good. And so we came up with these uh, campaigns in cities. Uh, so we did an analysis. We understood that, for example, in this street, even if the sidewalks are very wide and so people can walk easily, uh, nobody is walking there. And so, and so we just ask people, uh, I mean, why you're walking here and not there? And we invited them to participate to our workshop. Or in this square uh, where there were a lot of cyclists, but there is no bike lane. And so we asked the same question uh, according to the data that we gather, and we invited them to participate to, the, uh, to our workshops. And the same thing for public transport, uh, because there weren't any. So what we did basically was trying to involve people to co-design starting from data. And then we trigger an e-participation process not just about evaluating the solutions that came out, but uh, really uh, evaluating the problem that we were trying to solve. And then we offer this to decision makers for evaluation and to understand uh, what is feasible according to the governance of the city that of course it's uh, way more complex. And these are some, uh, some images of this workshop, some analysis that we have run, um, and of course, then we also use data in a more open form to, uh, for organizing datatons basically, uh, and trying to uh, came up with new ideas, uh, starting from the data that we have gathered, the monitoring station data and the app data. And that's it. So it's, uh, it's uh, I, I don't know, Domenico, am I okay? Time is up, but I think the most important part related to the to the to the today's topic was the last part about the data. That's why I give you the chance to present because it's very interesting how we can transform data that we that we gather through a game into another tool that can be useful also for mobility planners, uh, decision makers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to drive a different kind of impact, different from the behavior change that we are already trying to um, have and produce with MOVE. Thanks a lot, Toti, for you. So now we can move to the third speaker and we'll be talking about uh, uh, data-driven mobility uh, data. Uh, so, so, sorry, so um, the data-driven uh, innovation for mobility policy making. Uh, a very interesting point of view is, of course, uh, interactive and integrating uh, with the public administration, so the so-called uh, public-private uh, connection. And uh, that's why I loved the point of view that Benedetta San Just from Play Move raised when we talked uh, a couple of days ago. She said, I would like to talk about the data sharing between public and private sector, which in my opinion, it's very a, a key a point in uh, uh, trying to innovate together uh, with the public administration because most of the time the integration or the interaction is something crucial because we can have the best technology, the best uh, uh, innovation driven by data in the world, but if we are not able to translate and communicate and work with public administration, most of the time it's not very useful, it's not very effective. So the why uh, I, I loved uh, the, this kind of perfect perspective, so I've asked uh, Benedetta, uh, who is uh, general director of Playmove, to talk about the experience that they, as a private companies, as with many administration, and in particular some very interesting case studies in which they integrated other pieces of technology within their um, uh, platform in order to drive a very useful and effective innovation. So, Benedetta, please. Thank you, Domenico. You already said uh, <laughs> all my presentation. Uh, 
let me show you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Benedetta San Just. I work for Playcar. Playcar is a company that operates in the sharing mobility field in Cagliari, and since 2016, uh, we are uh, providing the service uh, using our own uh, software platform that we also license uh, worldwide uh, in white label. Uh, I want to thank Domenico for inviting me in this uh, interesting panel. Uh, the topic is central in, uh, in the era of uh, smart city, of smart mobility, uh, how to use data to, to make uh, sustainable and uh, efficient mobility policies. Um, as Domenico said, uh, I, I must be honest, uh, I thought a lot about how to approach the discussion because the, the topic uh, is, uh, is very broad, can be read from different perspectives. But since we all know that, uh, I mean, the data innovation uh, is here, um, I, 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 in the end, I have decided to, to bring the play car experience to, uh, to give some insights about the challenges that uh, we still need to, uh, to face in order to, to reach uh, a mobility, a mo mobility um, policy making that use data effectively. Um, when we talk about data and uh, smart mobility, we cannot but mention uh, mass. Mass mobility as a service uh, is defined as uh, a digital data-driven service. And uh, in my opinion, is uh, one of the best data-driven uh, policy uh, that a city can adopt for, um, for make mobility work. Uh, why uh, is important the mass? Well, um, the evolution of the transportation system has resulted in a complex network composed by private and public operators that usually uh, work uh, separately and um, regulated by mode. If uh, before, like 15 or 20 years ago, we had just three or four alternatives of transport, let's say car, bus, train, uh, metro. I won't mention bike because in Cagliari, bike was not taken into account as an alternative of transport 15 years ago. But well, now we have uh, hundreds of, um, uh, of travel alternatives and combination. We have car sharing, bike sharing, kick scooter sharing, ride hailing. So there is the need to integrate into a commercial uh, platform, that is the mass, all these different uh, bundle of private and, and public uh, travel mode options. And uh, the mass uh, allows to, to integrate information, uh, reservation and payment into a single app. Uh, we can say that mass provide a personalized mobility uh, while offering a cost and time savings for the traveler. So it is a powerful tool for sure. And all the data that um, go into the mass and come from the mass, they are useful and then they can benefit uh, the decision making process for, uh, for local authorities, for city planners. Um, and there is the need of cooperation between all the uh, actors that are involved in, uh, into the mobility environment to, to make the mass work. Uh, even if the mass uh, um, is recognized, is widely recognized as a powerful tool for making good policy uh, to, to reach uh, sustainable objectives and to, to help the traveler um, to make a good choice, um, even if this power is uh, recognized, there is still uh, only there are still only few platforms that uh, integrate uh, all the, the travel uh, options together, private and public. Why? Because mass is data driven. It's data driven. It needs work. Uh, it needs data to work. But 
there is still a lack of data sharing uh, between the different uh, operators uh, of the transportation system. Why there is a lack of data sharing? I have tried to identify the main reasons. And uh, in my opinion, these are the main reasons for uh, the lack of data sharing. The competition, the privacy, data specification and data analysis. Uh, the competition, there is uh, an ongoing discussion about why a transportation operator should share its data with other parts. Um, the Mm, all the actors involved in uh, providing a service, they see each other, usually they see each other as competitors, as rivals competing for the same customer base. So believe me, they are very jealous about their data. The privacy issue, we are working in a, in a European context. We all know that there might uh, exist uh, some non-compliance with the GDPR. Uh, anonymous data could be used to re-identify an individual or an activity. The point is that the boundary between uh, what can I give as an operator in terms of data and what I cannot give uh, sometimes is blurred. So there is a reluctance to, to give data to other parts. Um, data specification. <laughs> Let's say that I am an operator. I have no problem of competition with the other operators. I am confident uh, with uh, my privacy issue with my data. What data should I share? In which format? Uh, which is the standard? Uh, this is an ongoing discussion as well, because I think that the last uh, standardized format was established last year. It's called MDS um, format, Mobility Data Specification. Uh, it allows to, to compare different uh, mobility operator uh, services. But I mean, there is uh, still a lot uh, to, to be established in the data specification. And the fourth point is the data analysis. And uh, I think Lorenzo will agree with me that sometimes uh, there is a lack of uh, digital infrastructures of uh, software, but mainly Sometimes there is a lack of knowledge uh, about how to analyze data, transportation data. Um, so these challenges still need to, to, be, uh, to, be, to be addressed because the governance usually uh, goes with a lower speed compared to data innovation. So we need to find an approach to, to, to facilitate the, the use of mass and the, the data sharing. We can wait for a top-down approach. There are many funding programs that um, at European, at uh, Italian level, that are trying to boost with big money uh, the data sharing and the implementation of mass. But there is also another approach, and here is where uh, PlayCar and PlayMove uh, uh, come into the picture. And it, this is the, the bottom-up approach. I want to, to bring the, our experience today because Playcar operates in Cagliari since 2013. We have started with only five vehicles in station-based uh, um, uh, booking mode. Now we operate with more than 100 vehicles in uh, station-based free-floating and one-way uh, configuration. We also provide the bike sharing of um, service of the city. We are going to start with uh, 200 kick scooters in 2021. Uh, we are waiting the authorization to go. And uh, we manage all these uh, uh, alternatives of transport using our own platform, Playmove. Uh, Playmove is a SaaS for mass that allow to, allows to uh, manage different kind of vehicle, different booking mode at the same time. And we have also integrated smart parking uh, module and uh, um, charging uh, station protocol. We are doing it uh, actually. Um, the point is that we are working in Cagliari um, 
since 2013. And we have always co co cooperated with other uh, actors. Uh, we ran the, the bike sharing system with a public transport company uh, until a few months ago. And uh, uh, we have recently uh, integrated with the local uh, public local authority uh, a parking system, a smart parking system using uh, NB-IoT sensors that allows the public administration to manage their paid parking area. So we are just a technological provider, uh, but uh, we, can, uh, we can integrate the, the, the smart parking system of the city into, uh, into the PlayCar app. So our customer can use also the, smart, uh, the public, uh, the public uh, smart parking system to, uh, to find the best route to their parking lot, uh, parking parking slot. Uh, this, is a, this is a good example, I think, of uh, cooperation between uh, private and public uh, uh, operators into, into the same environment. Uh, and it is a, a good example of, um, of data sharing, of uh, cooperation, basically, of uh, a bottom-up approach. Uh, this is what uh, I think it, it is important to, to, to do nowadays in order to facilitate uh, the, the integration of all of uh, the services. And so I have finished uh, with this. <laughs> Happiness only real well shared. <laughs> uh, the same applies to, to data, basically. Thank you, Domenico. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Matt, for your contribution. Uh, I think it was really, really interesting. And in particular, yeah, the thing that I said at the beginning, I mean, how you as a private company were able to connect the public administration to integrate a service that was originally not part of your platform. It's very interesting and give my opinion a nice example of how innovation should work with public, with public sector. So thanks again. Now we're moving uh, to the last but not least, of course, speaker. Um, I ask you the opportunity to make a fair to stay a bit more because we'd like at least to have a couple of questions from the audience. But before, of course, it's time for our uh, last speaker, so Lorenzo Meschini, who is uh, CEO of PTV Sistema. PTV Sistema is a spin off PTV Group together with the University of La Sapienza of Rome. So it's a kind of research and development department for the PTV Group, which deals uh, uh, with uh, traffic prediction, traffic management software and services, infomobility, etc. etc. I thought uh, to leave Lorenzo as the last speaker because I think it's the uh, right person to provide uh, the wider overview about data, in particular our data analysis can become a really powerful tool to understand how mobility is going within city and so can, we can change it or try to modify it or enhance it. Uh, it will present some international and national, international case studies that with his group he, he managed, so Lorenzo, please. Thank you, Domenico. Um, I think I need uh, the permission to share the screen, uh, which uh, probably you have to give me, because I have a couple of slides, but I am not. Okay. Not yet. Okay. All right. Coming. Okay. So. Perfect. You see it, I think, right? Okay, good morning, I'm Lorenzo. Yes, I'm the, the managing director of the PTV system. I'm a transport engineer. So just a few words about PTV, about what we do. We basically build uh, tools, solutions, software, and we have knowledge about, uh, you know, trying to contribute uh, with the tools and instruments to, to optimize the mobility of people and of, uh, of goods uh, worldwide. So that's, that's really basically our mission, to, to, to support actors, decision makers at any level to, to, you know, to improve the, the mobility, anything that moves, uh, anything that moves around. Uh, in particular, the, the, the subsidiary I run, which is based in Rome in Italy, deals with uh, um, real-time traffic uh, and mobility management and control. So we basically build uh, uh, control rooms, uh, uh, informability tools, uh, journey planners, and things like that. We used to be, yes, we, we were born as a spin-off of University La Sapienza. Today we are a full uh, 
uh, PTB uh, subsidiary. So just uh, really a few words about the journey we made uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, field, let's say. So we, I mean, we can come from a rather traditional approach uh, in, the, in the transport planning uh, field, uh, in, at least from an engineering point of view. Um, we basically uh, build a uh, model. So how we try to understand the mobility, how we help uh, cities or consultant to understand the mobility using models, uh, analytical model, mathematical model, which of course are based on data uh, and used to be based on data. But this, I mean, the, the model part was a big part of the game. Why? Because there were not enough data. I mean, we are talking about, uh, you know, analyzing, predicting mobility, either in real time for traffic management or offline for transport planning, master plan and so on since uh, many decades okay but the amount of data which is there today was not uh, even uh, could be not even imagining even few years ago uh, however based on this approach even for real-time traffic management i mean yes this is just uh, uh, an insight of how models are actually built but this is just for transport planner nerds like myself so we can skip it and based on that we built already a lot of uh, uh, real-time traffic and mobility management uh, uh, application. When I say mobility, I mean multimodal. So looking not only at track or cars, but also on how tra public transport and people inside public transport or inside cars or moving maybe with bicycle and so on are actually behaving uh, uh, currently and how we can actually manage what, what is going on in the city or, or in an area at that very moment, uh, from the point of view of the authority of the administration, which is actually in charge of making all of that running as smoothly and as uh, uh, safely uh, as possible. Um, you see here just a few pictures of uh, some of the uh, biggest application we made. This is a regional uh, application uh, in, in the northwest of, uh, of Italy, in Regione Piemonte. Uh, we have application uh, in the in the Vienna region, actually, uh, all all Austria, and here we are. We, for example, we supported, we provided technology for a multimodal journey planner based on real time information nationwide. And when I say real time information, I mean from traffic to actual position of public transport, uh, going uh, from the national level trains to down really the local urban uh, uh, public transport in the major city cities of, uh, of uh, Austria and in particular uh, Vienna. Um, and this is instead, for example, an application which is really very data driven, but uh, because it's looking at current traffic condition, but actually doesn't have the capability to, uh, to predict, to, to, to make a scenario and alternatives. Because actually the main topic uh, that we face it and we are facing still today, it's a kind of trade-off between the modeling approach and more data-driven or uh, approaches. Uh, what is the problem? The problem is that models on one side are very good, but are complex. I mean, to build uh, a model to understand the mobility and the traffic, it's something that is cumbersome. It requires a lot of uh, time, effort, money, and competence from traffic engineers and so on. On the other side, more, uh, let's call it automatic, although I'm not saying that building, uh, you know, uh, machine learning models uh, and uh, statistical model, more data driven model, it's easy and straightforward. Although the mainstream today tell us that story, uh, it's not true that it, because just because you collect data, you will magically understand what's going on and more even important what to do. That's not true, but it appears to be more simple and that's to some extent true. So how we can combine, let's say, the power of data and data elaboration technique uh, with the, the, the capability of, mo of traditional analytical model? This, if you want, was really our challenge. So since already a few years, actually, we started to, to, to work on that based also on the new data sets which were coming out. So one of the first experience we made was GP, with GP, um, with floating car data. So basically trajectories, trajectories collected by mobile phone or mobile phone, sorry, or black box uh, inside the cars for, for insurance purposes. You know that many cars nowadays are equipped uh, with, uh, with the tools that basically detect the position of the car, mainly to recover it if it was stolen. But today also to 
um, you know, analyze uh, driving behaviors and so on. So all this data allow us, I mean, we could use those data built actually for something else, mainly for insurance, to try to understand if we could build the mobility patterns and help transport planners, urban planners, to take more informed, more informed decision. And I think in that, uh, this is quite similar to the experience that were shown by, by uh, the other speakers before me. Um, we combined uh, this kind of data collected with so pure trajectories with uh, uh, tools and application interacting more with the user trying to understand the underlying uh, reasons and, um, of uh, move, moving. So maybe also uh, purpose, and which is quite important, or maybe some characteristic of the people. But with the combination of large floating car data sets and maybe few sampling and few questions, of course, expanding this with the socioeconomical data. So we actually some of the traditional models, and that's something I want to show you later, we were able to build uh, a number of outputs which are quite usual in our field, but they were built in a completely new day. So extracting this trajectory, cleaning the trajectory, associating the trajectory to a transport graph, to basically a mathematical representation of the road network, we were able to understand not only origins and destination of people, so the density of this uh, starting and ending of the trip, but also which were the main path, main roads used uh, by these uh, trips, um, understanding of uh, speeds and bottlenecks uh, also within the sea, different time of the day or different day of the week, for example, or different months. So, um, and also understanding some model split, uh, this connected with the, the possibility to do mode transport mode recognition automatically, which is also uh, a topic I will show you later. Another experience uh, was to try to do uh, trans uh, traffic forecast, meaning uh, predicting flows, number of cars uh, or speeds. Uh, so what will be the speeds uh, or drop of speeds in a few minutes uh, on, on some roads? And you can imagine that these are, are quite important things uh, uh, thinking about uh, not only traffic management, but also, for example, uh, safety. So being able to predict uh, a drop in speed uh, on a road, uh, meaning a queue forming up uh, for, for, and being able to broadcast this information a uh, few seconds, a uh, few minutes before it happens, it can be quite uh, useful for, for safety reason. Um, if you think of outside the city, actually. Um, so we did, uh, actually, the, the interesting thing we did here was uh, to try to combine the machine learning approach, uh, so basically, uh, I mean, using neural networks or, 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 or similar uh, tools with the traditional model-based approach. And not surprisingly, we, dis we discovered that uh, with a smart combination of traditional approach plus innovative uh, um, approach, it was possible to improve uh, the forecast uh, we did, uh, uh, we are doing in real time. So basically this is a forecast in flows and speed on roads done, let's say 15 to one hour before the actual, um, I mean, before reality, let's say. So it's even easy, even too easy to, to discover how good was the prediction because you just have to wait 15 minutes or 60 minutes and then you measure. And unfortunately or luckily uh, you will be uh, similar or quite different from the from the from the reality. Um, I mean, GHH and uh, and and the other measures. I mean, the GH is a is a specific measure we use uh, in transport engineering. But I think uh, you can see that the, the message here was really the improving uh, the improvement it's possible to achieve um, doing this kind of combination. The last uh, element uh, I wanted to talk about was the mode recognition. Mode recognition is quite important because, yes, it really, as we said, data are not enough. From data, we need to extract information um, to take decision, to take informed decision. So uh, to, to collect a trajectory of which you know nothing uh, um, is not so useful to, to, to understand uh, or to make decisions, to, to understand what to do for the people behind that trajectory. Uh, because that trajectory was built uh, for some purpose, 
by a person with some characteristic, with some needs, with, with a given mode of transport, and either you ask those information to the person, <laughs> to the producer of the trajectory, or you need to extract those information from the trajectory itself somehow. So we started trying to extract this information, which is not so easy as it appeared to be, even uh, if you think you have some data. So just coming to the conclusion, yes, on one side, uh, we discovered that uh, uh, combining uh, uh, data-driven models, uh, machine learning techniques with the traditional uh, analytical model uh, used by urban and transport planners, transport and traffic engineers uh, since many years provide clearly benefits, not only in terms of quality eh, of the output uh, we give to the decision maker, but also in terms of speed to produce that output and making also easier, more scalable, more replicable. So basically allowing also community which we didn't have the, the money or the uh, competence to handle such complex uh, models to actually access uh, this kind of analysis, this kind of quantitative analysis. However, on the other side, uh, um, I mean, I already said uh, this, but then, however, on the other side, we see, and this is really, honestly, a concluding position, which is quite strong, but in my experience, the availability of significant, clean, normalized, and more important label or data set in the mobility field is still an open issue, not open. Um, it's, and that's what I was talking about before. The, this fairy tale uh, of uh, you know, the artificial intelligence solving uh, every problem of the humankind uh, since today and forever uh, it's, it's not true. Uh, I think generally speaking, it's not yet true for, for mobility. The, when you start trying to really use these um, techniques in our field and to produce uh, meaningful information, it's, it's really hard to find, uh, even to find data set. And look here, I'm not even talking about open data. Eh? You can see that I didn't talk about money or, 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 open, uh, or, or open data. Even to buy uh, data sets is not so easy because, uh, I mean, because of a very naive uh, reason. Uh, in order to train uh, uh, any statistical algorithm or even any analytical algorithm for what matters, you need uh, some human beings that told you that that trajectory is a bus or is a or was a done uh, uh, with a car or with a bicycle uh, or for the purpose and so on and to have uh, wide and consistent and good uh, data set of this kind is not so easy often you see authorities or even uh, public data set uh, claiming uh, you know to have collected a big uh, bunch of data and typically that's the case but when you start uh, trying to use those data to actually uh, train uh, um, such application you discover that you are just uh, at the beginning of a long journey which is quite fun and that's what we will do definitely we are doing next month in the next year but it's definitely something we need to still work with public authorities and also in general with the, all the stakeholders, the, 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 the possibility to share and to decide how to share data uh, in this field. So that's, that's basically my, my contribution to the discussion. Thanks a lot, Lorenzo. I think that this was really a nice way with your conclusion to conclude the, the presentation of our panel. And uh, I thank you again for the very nice overview you provided about the system you're working with and in particular how it can be integrated in order to extract more and more value, provide more and more uh, services uh, to improve mobility within, within cities. Uh, we are a bit uh, uh, on, on a delay of 10 minutes. We should have uh, ended 10 minutes ago, but there is the opportunity to stay if you want another five minutes, I know that Toti probably must run because he has another pitch to do. <laughs> so I would say goodbye to him. Ciao, guys. We are raising money and there is a startup pitch I have to attend. <laughs> so.
Thank you. And I, I try my, my best to stay until Lorenzo finished. Uh, it's super interesting. And, but uh, I, I leave you in the hands of Domenico in this, with two hats. So push and move. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Domenico, for having me. Ciao. Thank you, Salvo. And since there are uh, some, some people from the audience, I would like to ask them if there are questions for the, uh, for the speakers in particular, to, uh, if there are to someone in, in particular. There is a, a question from, from Federico. Uh, he's saying, uh, talking about privacy, how do these services make sure that the users are not uh, classificated? Uh, I don't know who wants to answer. I think it's something that can, it's a question that very often can be answered by any of you because you all talked about services that basically are collecting information. So I don't know who wants to provide a brief of, uh, overview about uh, the privacy and security aspects. Um, well, maybe I can pitch in for the open data cam part. Um, when analyzing the video streams, um, the only data that is actually captured is what object has been classified. So um, like I mentioned, um, all the video data and um, picture data is actually discarded in the moment that it is, um, that it is um, processed. So the only um, data saved is vehicle, bicycle, um, pedestrian, whatever object that is classified that is found. Um, so we believe that um, privacy is, um, is, uh, is, is, is kept there. And also it doesn't leave the machine. So uh, it's all processed within the machine. But that's only talking about um, maybe a thought to um, the other two. I think the more interesting part is looking at the aggregated um, amount of data. But I think Lorenzo can probably say more to that. Yeah, I think uh, really briefly. In our case, um, as as long as you don't, we don't we don't care about the the, the person. We care about, uh, as I said, the the, the position, so the trajectory, and um, maybe the, the the way of transport used uh, or something like that. Um, clearly, uh, this means that trajectory can be anonymized completely. Also, from a point of view of origin and destination, which can be quite sensitive. So it's possible to, you know, maybe make a little fuzzy uh, origin and destination or, or and, and when we aggregate uh, uh, this kind of trajectory, the big numbers will, will allow to anonymize data. Of course, when it comes down to very few trajectory of very precise origin and destination, that can be a privacy issue. But as I said, I think it's, uh, it's a matter of the, um, of the, who collects the data to ensure that data are treated uh, accordingly with the G GPR and accordingly with the, how data are declared to be treated to the user. Uh, don't forget that all the users here, are, and I'm, I'm sure I'm talking for Rafael and Benedetta as well, typically they provide their consents after they understood very clearly how their data will, will be treated and with, with which purposes. So. I mean, of course, it's a matter of, uh, uh, I mean, respecting the contract, uh, it's done with the users and respecting the law uh, at the end. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Lorenzo and Rafael. I think you both answered to the question about privacy. I yeah, I, I want to add something. More than in general, it, it was demonstrated that more than 60% of uh, people, they are willing to share their personal data. So usually the problem is not for travelers, but is for uh, other stakeholders in, uh, in the mobility environment, usually. But I mean, the, the question is perfect because the privacy is always an issue, always. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, in particular, there was also the European law, the GDPR, who basically was established the past two two years ago. So I read that uh, is uh, uh, regulate is, is regulating all the aspects of private and security connected in general with our European citizens. And I think the, all the apps and services and ideas that were presented uh, are GDPR compliant. So with privacy is always granted. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not seeing other questions from the audience. So since uh, it's almost uh, uh, off 
past 11. I would end the panel here. So thanks again, guys, for being here, for sharing your very really, uh, uh, inspiring, uh, interesting, and helpful stories, projects, uh, insights. It was really a pleasure for me having you here. I hope you enjoyed as well. And I look forward to see you in the future, to involve you in uh, future projects and opportunities, panels, and events, because it was really, really interesting uh, uh, sharing the um, stage with you today. So thanks again, Lorenzo, Rafael, Benedetta, I thought you lived. Thank you. Thank you. And guys, have a nice day and hope to see you soon.